Hi, I'm Nate from AppAssembler. Um, I'm the founder and CEO, and this is our first DockerCon. We're really excited to be here. I'm Brian Dant, software engineer at AppAssembler. Uh, we're very grateful to be presenting to you today. Thank you for listening to us. All right, so uh, just a few words about AppAssembler so you know a little bit about our company. Uh, we offer OpenEdX as a service. So what is OpenEdX, you may ask? OpenEdX is open source software that allows companies and universities to deliver online courses. So we built OpenEdX powered solutions for Microsoft, Cloudera, Financial Times, uh, as well as universities like Penn State, Open University, and MIT Sloan. So in the next half hour, we're going to be telling you a story, which should hopefully illustrate the problem that we're trying to solve. And then we will present a Docker-powered solution that we came up to solve our customer's problem. OK, yeah, so this story is uh, it highlights the problem that we're trying to solve. The names and the actors uh, have been changed to protect the innocent. It's also important to note that we'll be putting our hands up to the side of our head to use a fake phone because we're 90s kids. But it didn't really happen like that. We use Google Hangouts. Ring, 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 ring. Hello, this is Peter at AppSembler. Hey, Peter, this is Michael from Inatech. Hope you're doing well today. I've got a little problem on my hands. We're really happy with the recent OpenEdX implementation that you guys did for us. It seems like AppSembler is a really good set of people, really talented, super nice, efficient, always deliver on time. Well, I'm humbled. It's really nice that you would say something like that about us. Wait, did you say you were from Inatech or Inatrode? Uh, Inatech. Anyway, so here's my problem. We've got a service that allows us to train our new customers using virtual labs, but when someone wants to take a course, they call me on my phone, and I execute a command in PuTTY to start a VM, and then I get their SSH keys, and then they SSH into this machine to play with our software. It's really cool, but it's a little cumbersome, and it tends to make our customers a little upset. They often have trouble logging in and stuff. It's getting pretty bad. We even had a user come to our office and stuff potatoes in the tailpipe of our car because his VM kept crashing. Yikes. That sounds a bit problematic. I'm going to jump right on this. I'll go talk to our DevOps people and see if they know of a better way. OK, great. Thanks, Peter. Wait, what does DevOps mean? I'm not really sure, but one of our employees, Samir, just came back from a thing called DockerCon, and he keeps calling himself a DevOps person. Goodbye, Michael. Ring, 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 ring. Hello, this is Michael, lead product manager at Intech. Hello, Michael. I'm so glad to hear your voice. I have great news for you. I've talked with our DevOps guru, Samir, and he's found a solution. It turns out there's a really smart, creative, and helpful bunch of people associated with this DockerCon thing that Samir went to, and they've created this tool called Docker. I'm just a simple web developer, so I don't really get it, but it sounds like it will allow you to make VMs really quickly. Wow, Peter, that's great. I'm on board. Can you build us something that uses that? Yes, yes we can. I'll work on it for a couple of sprint cycles, and then I'll get back to you. I'm not sure how much this will cost, but it'll be like pennies for a successful company like Inatech. Great, thanks. Ring, 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 ring. Hello, this is Michael with Inatech. Hello, Michael. I've got some great news for you. We've completed the first version of the Virtual Labs product. We're calling it Wharf, and it's using the technology I told you about, Docker. There's a web interface that lets you create these things called containers, and you... Well, Peter, that's great to hear, but uh, I kind of like calling these things virtual machines. But I guess containers is OK. Uh, oh, did you say you were calling it WIF? No, it's Wharf. Uh, you see this Docker technology, they use a boat metaphor to explain the container thing. We're piggybacking off of that. And this application is like when you pull your boat into a wharf and unload the containers, and the web interface is like the shore, and the Docker hosts are like the warehouses where you store your stuff. And Wait, what? Never mind. Just call it WIF and go log in. We'll send you a bill. Ring, 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 ring. Hello, this is Peter. Peter, my buddy, it's so great to hear your voice. We've been using WIF for a while now, and it's really great. Totally bug free in the first try. Y'all are good. But we've got this conference coming up, and we'd like to have a bunch of containers started at the same time. Can WIF do that? Yes, I think WIF can do that. How many containers do you need? Well, let's see. There's going to be three courses, and each course will have about 50 people. OK, now we're getting to some big scale. I don't really know about how scaling works, but I bet Samir does. Let me ping him on Slick. Yep, he says that three courses with 50 people should be no problem. We'll have 150 containers ready on Thursday night for the conference on Saturday. Great. Ring, 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 ring. This is Peter. 
Hey, Peter, this is Michael. I'm just calling to see if you're ready for the conference this weekend. Have you created the cluster and started the 450 containers for Saturday? Yeah, we're, uh, yeah, we're ready to go. Samir, Initro needs 450 containers by tomorrow, not 150. Wait, what? That's not a problem? Wow, Docker and Swarm must be really powerful. I'm really glad you went to that conference last week. All right, so how many of you here consider yourself uh, technical users, like a developer, DevOps, sysadmin? Raise your hand. Okay, great. And how many of you consider yourself a business person? A few people. All right, it's good to know. So we've got a little something in this talk for both groups. Um, if you've ever taken a course or provided training, you will likely recognize this problem. So the problem is simple. Getting every student's environment set up to even begin the training can often be a huge pain point. Different operating systems, dependencies to be installed, lockdown laptops, these are all obstacles that will derail an otherwise perfectly rehearsed training session. So the story we just reenacted um, is similar to a situation that we went through a couple months ago. There are three pr broad groups in this story. AppSembler, that's us, the customer, and the user of the product, um, who is usually the customer of our customer. And there's an interface for both the customer, the admin user, and the end user, our customer's customer. So it's best to envision a student as somebody who's taking an open edX course and doing so to learn a new piece of software or learning how to interact with new technology, often writing code re related to that technology. So in the case of the admin user, they want to create a master lab environment. They want to expose that lab environment to their students. Then they want to embed that lab in a course so that the students can get their own environment. And then for the student, they want to be able to launch that lab environment from a course, dispose that environment when they're done with it, and then optionally resume that lab environment. So let's talk about the requirements and constraints around the system in order to frame this problem from a technical perspective. In order to make the labs effective, we identified the following constraints. So the system needs to be configurable. Uh, we have many small labs with different variations, and they, they should be created easily. So a given course might have four labs, each of which should, should show a different state of the software, allowing the, the student to interact with it. So for example, when a customer is creating a course, they might have four lessons for one open edX course. Lesson one gives them some skeleton code as a starting point. Then lesson two allows them to start a container that contains a particular bug. The user can then fix the bug, answer a question in the open edX course, and then move on to the next step. Lessons three and four uh, can follow the same rhythm, but maybe now we're asking the student uh, to add a front end to the back end API, or deploying the code in a production scenario. So we need to be able to snapshot the house at different stages of development and let the student easily pop in at any different stage. So as mentioned, the end user, the one who we're most trying to please, and the one who has the least familiarity with the system is a student. And our, syst our, our system must not introduce any friction into this process. So the student might be taking a free course or one mandated by their employer, and they don't really have the patience to download or install anything or sign up for another service. So friction at this point can cause the loss of a customer. It's critical that the lab software doesn't add any friction. The student shouldn't need to know anything about Docker. Um, they're not required to make a new account or know in any way that they're interacting with the second system. And when our customer first came to us, they were using a third-party VM service that required the student to register and validate their email address, and this just caused way too much friction. So as you can see, it's, it's important that our, these, these containers are disposable, so our customer isn't paying for resources that they're not using. And as students make their way through the courses, they can create several containers, and our application needs to be able to clean those containers up easily when the students are done with them. I want to reiterate that we're not making a production environment here. We're not making images that are intended to persist beyond the length of the course. These are containers that will be played with, reconfigured, broken, fixed, and ultimately thrown away. Another requirement is the system needs to be auditable. So these are three examples of reports that our customers have told us they want. They want to know how many students are uh, using a container at a given time. They want to see how many containers uh, were used during the last month and which department should be billed for specific containers. And as you can imagine, um, the customer can come up, come up with any number of additional reports uh, about usage and cost. 
Our customer's application can use a lot of memory, which means that we have constraints around how many containers of their software we can run on a given machine. So if we get a relatively small spike in users, say 50, we have to start thinking about adding machines to handle the influx of new containers. So scalability becomes really important when we have unpredictable usage. Sometimes we have the luxury of our customer telling us that they're going to invite hundreds of people to spin up lab environments, but more likely they're just going to do it without telling us, and we'll have to make sure that the system continues to work under heavy load. This is also really important. The containers that the students create need to be exactly the same, ensuring that they're all learning on the same platform and maybe being tested on the same things. And this is where the power of Docker's cross-platform identical setup comes in. So for example, many laptops create the problem of many environments. Or in some companies, these laptops are locked down and employees can't even install new software on them. Docker allows us to give each student the exact same environment running in the cloud no matter what kind of laptop or operating system they're using. Okay, so let's talk about the solution that we came up to satisfy these business requirements. So AppAssembler uh, serves both the business user, the course author, or the curator of these lab environments, and the student, in this case, the customer of our customer. And we provide an interface for both users. So admin user and student. And I want to highlight these two elements on the page because this is the heart of the solution. On the left, you can see the admin user is creating the lab, the master lab, we call it. And on the right, you can see the student creating their own instance from that master lab. So to illustrate this more clearly, I'm going to show a short video that demonstrates how the admin user creates the lab environment, embeds it in the courseware for the student to access. OK, go back. I need to go back one and hit play. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So we're going to create a student lab from a Jupyter notebook image. So we already have the base uh, notebook loaded here. We just say create container, and we give it a name. Uh, we're going to call this uh, Twitter IPython notebook. So we're now creating a container that we can prepare for student usage. That just takes about a second to load. OK, so we just created that container. And it's now running. And to connect to it, we just click on that URL. And you can see, when it first starts up, the notebook is empty. There's, there's nothing in there. So let's add a new notebook. So we just upload. I have one all ready to go here. Um, this is the mining Twitter IPython notebook. So open that. OK, so now we have the mining Twitter notebook uploaded for student use. Let's go back into the, uh, the virtual lab interface. And now what we're going to do is we're going to snapshot that. So we click Save as Image. And what that does is it creates an image with that IPython notebook already ready to go, preloaded. And let's call this the student, uh, student Twitter notebook. Hit Save. And you can see it's saving it. OK, so the last step here is to make a project that can be launched from the Open edX course. So we just click on New Project, and this is where we can specify how many days we want this lab environment to run. It could be 24 hours, it could be a week, it could be a month, however long we want it to run. We'll just say four days. OK, so now we've created that project and gave it a name. It's called St uh, Student Twitter Notebook. And now we're going to jump over to our courseware management, our learning management system. And here we're going to add a container launcher, and we're going to paste in the name of our project, Student Twitter Notebook. We can give it a friendly name. And this is what it's going to look like to the student. They're just going to see one button, and they click that button, and immediately the, the student lab environment launches, and they have a URL that's a unique URL for that student. They can click on that link, and boom, there they've got the, the mining Twitter IPython notebook all ready to go. OK, so let's focus on the admin user who's creating this curated environment for the student. What does that workflow look like? Uh, Brian's going to explain this in more detail. OK, so the steps in the video that we saw um, go like this. So in step number one, the admin user finds an image displayed in the dashboard. Step number two, they make a request to create a container from that image, then modify the container to the desired state. In step number three, the user snapshots the container back to an image. In step number four, they do final meta configuration on the image, 
adding the proper URLs, a username and password if applicable, and opening up the proper ports. Finally, they take the JavaScript widget and add it to the OpenEdX course. OK, so let's take a closer look at the student experience. But this time, instead of a Jupyter notebook, um, the student is going to launch an instance of, a, of Cloud9, which is a complete web-based IDE. OK, so again, we have the button that says Launch Cloud9 Twitter Example Site. They just click on that. And now we have a URL, but we also have a username and password uh, to log into that environment. So we click on that link, and we're now launching a complete web-based IDE in the browser that already has all the code examples are preloaded for the student. And here they can change the Python code. They can save it. Um, they get a command prompt where they can execute scripts and start processes. <clears throat> Um, they can also, uh, from the file menu, they can download this entire project to their local computer if they want and save it for offline use. I want to re remind you that this is a personalized sandbox. It's completely isolated from all the other student sandboxes. They have their own Linux container that they can do whatever they want in it. And if they shut this down and they come back, it will remember where they left off. In fact, it'll even remember where the cursor was in the editing window. OK, so that widget displays the button for the student who's taking the course. And when the student clicks this button, a request is made to the web API to create the new container. And Brian's going to now talk through another diagram which shows um, the details behind what's happening behind the scenes. Yeah, we're going to use this diagram to, to, to try to segue into uh, the technical components of, of the application. So, Step number one, the user has clicked on the button in OpenEdX. The request is made to the Django server, which is shown in step two. Step three, four, and five, the Django app sends a request to Swarm, which then creates the container. In step six, the Django app returns a response to the student in the OpenEdX LMS. In step seven, a request is made back to the primary server. A tool called Apache picks up the request from, picks up the request, and in step eight, routes the request to the IP and port of the returning of the running container, finally returning an HTTP response from the web application running in that container. So the components of our stack, uh, which I'll go through now, are a front-end web application, which is uh, Django and React.js, and of course, Docker, Docker Swarm, console, and Docker registry. The first component is the front-end web app. So, so as a side note, uh, um, we've been working on this for about 18 months with one developer on the project for that time. So if you're interested in, in doing something similar, that might give you a sense for how much work it might be. So as I mentioned, we use Django as a web API uh, using the Django REST framework to manage the endpoints and the Django ORM to manage the database persistence. This application handles requests both from the admin dashboard and the student requests that come from the widget that we talked about a few, a few slides ago. We rely on Dockerpy to do a lot of the heavy lifting for us. And we use React.js primarily um, because we like it and people on the team knew it well. So there's nothing special about it that makes it um, particularly good for this situation. Overall, there's nothing super complex about this web application. Uh, the big challenge is keeping our Postgres database uh, synced with the Docker API. If you're considering making something like this, I suspect syncing will be your, your primary challenge. We've got several Docker hosts, and all of the containers and images on those hosts need to be properly represented in our database. Um, we, our original process for syncing was that we had a cron job that hit the Docker API, pulled out all of the images and containers, and then checked their status in the database, adding, modifying, and deleting database records as appropriate. I actually suggest that you start the exact opposite way. So we're now making the Django API the primary endpoint for interacting with Docker and prioritizing uh, a push sync method instead of a polling method. Now we're going to move on to talk about Docker and why it's specifically useful for our situation. So we're using these containers like VMs. Uh, they're sandboxes, one-off containers that students modify, and then uh, we destroy them. So far, we found that Docker fits our requirements very well. The most important thing is the quick startup time of Docker. So one of our customers had a similar application that was using virtual machines, and those virtual machines took a long time to start for each user. And the quicker startup times of Docker have been very satisfying for them. Docker also makes the instructor development workflow very easy. So being able to think about branching models, 
within Docker repositories has opened up a lot of opportunities for reusability and efficiency. Being able to commit and pass around images allows trainers to iterate on each other's work very, very well, very easily. And finally, Docker registry is also very critical for us. So the basic processes are seamless with this setup. Distributing images to a new host within a cluster or archiving a no longer used image is, is no problem at all. Allowing technical users to create and push their own images, which non-technical users can then modify and distribute to students, is also a point of efficiency. So moving on to the next critical component of our stack, uh, the Docker, it's Docker Swarm. And the Docker Swarm page says that Docker Swarm is native clustering for Docker. Uh, it turns a pool of Docker hosts into a single virtual host. I don't know if Moby said that. Maybe, maybe Moby said that. Um, so Docker Swarm is an important piece of our stack because it allows us to manage several nodes, easily scaling and reducing as needed based on the current needs of the customer. Uh, one great thing about Swarm is that it serves as a, the standard Docker API. So any tool which already communicates with a Docker daemon can use Swarm to transparently scale to multiple hosts. And that was us. We were using Docker Pi to talk directly to the Docker API. We were able to plug Swarm in uh, by just updating a few parameters. And two other features that helped us immensely are the labels and affinity features of Swarm. We can allow people to group images based on specific business department, a course that they're working with, or a conference that they plan to, to use the service for. And all of the containers will be distributed to the same host. This is good for billing, resource allocation, and safety. For example, uh, when protecting containers from other less mature containers. We've been pretty happy with Swarm and we've had a lot of success with it. So they've worked out a lot of bugs over the last 12 months and the project seems to be on, on a great track. Moving on to the final component of our stack, a uh, fairly simple component, but also a critical one. We use console from HashiCorp, which builds itself as service discovery and configuration made easy, a distributed, highly available, and data center aware. And I'm certain that Moby did not say that. Okay. So we use console for swarm node discovery to replace the built-in but non-production swarm discovery service. Console allows us to efficiently and reliably discover Docker nodes. Um, secondly, we use it for high availability of Swarm managers. The Swarm's built-in leader management capacity needs a, a key value store, and Console does that for us. Uh, you can have several instances of a Swarm manager running, and if one goes down, Swarm will elect another to lead. It sounds like we might be uh, able to eliminate Console with the, the new Docker Swarm 1.12 that was announced yesterday. Okay, so um, some other ideas that we've had um, <clears throat> after the first version of this is um, one of the requests we get from the, the admin users is um, to be able to see the log data that's coming back from the container. So when they're creating these environments, uh, they need to sort of debug them and make sure that they're actually going to work for the students. Uh, so that's a feature that we've been talking about adding. Um, Another would be providing uh, a web-based SSH or Docker exec so that students could access the shell without actually having to have a, a desktop terminal application installed on their computer. Um, also embedding the lab directly in the course so they don't have to open up a new window. And then um, once they've done the exercise, actually having some sort of audit process. So this could mean like SSHing into the container to check to see that they actually did the steps that they were instructed to do. Um, or running like a Selenium test against a web application to make sure that they actually completed the steps of the, of the exercise. Um, another thing that we've thought about is once you've got this container running in the cloud, having some way that you could pull that container down as an image onto your local machine so that you could, you could continue working on the project sort of after you finish the class and you'd already have like an environment sort of pre-configured and ready to go. Um, so those are some of our ideas. Um, we'd love to hear from you, the audience, uh, if you have ideas that you'd like to see. Um, and I think with that, um, we'll just open it up for questions. We'd love to chat with you. You can tweet us. You can email us. Um, this bit.ly link down in the lower left will take you to a blog post with more information about the project. Uh, and I think we've got about 15, 20 minutes for questions. So. Yeah, so um, this platform is software agnostic, so really anything that you can run on Linux, you can run using this. Um, 
we've created these base images from images that we found on Docker Hub. So like if there's a pandas uh, image on Docker Hub, we can pull it in and you can use that as a base image. Does that answer your question? So do they have to understand Docker then in order to use this as instructor? No, the instructors don't have, the question is do the instructors need to know anything about Docker? Uh, the answer is no. That's why we created this web dashboard so that the instructors don't have to actually know anything about Docker. They can just launch a new container from a base image, connect to that container, curate it, snapshot it, and then use it in their course. Mm -hmm. So they never actually have to have Docker running on their computer. They can do everything through the web dashboard. Yeah, they'll need to, they'll need to configure the ports that need to be open within that specific container. So that's the, that's the level of technical capacity that they need. So if there's a developer around that can say open you know, port 8080, or whatever needs to be open, then they can, they can just put that port in and open it up. Um, yeah, so from the admin panel, they have the ability to create the image, customize it, and then re-snapshot it. When they re-snapshot that, does that just sit on the swarm nodes, or do you actually push that back to some sort of registry or Docker hub? Right now, it just, it just sits on the swarm nodes uh, right now, um, and we're sort of half implemented with fully automating the process to push to Docker, Docker registry. So we do some stuff automatically with the Docker registry right now, but we don't do that yet. Mm -hmm. Thank Any you. more questions? Yes. Thanks for the session. Uh, this link will have, uh, you have your practice lab and stuff like that to try it out, or uh, we'll have to approach you? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Is there a way to do the practice with the resources in the learning labs? Will we be able to test it like a GitHub, you know, download and check things out? Uh, so this, oh, this product that we're showing is not, uh, it's not on GitHub. It's in a, okay. it's in a private repo. Um, but we'd be happy to open it up for beta testing if, if you want to try it out. OK, thank you. Anyone else? Hi. Uh, could you give us a bit more details about how you're using console and which of those parts do you think they will be obsoleted in 12? Yeah, we, we mentioned that at the end that uh, now that Swarm is sort of built in to Docker um, and it, it seems to have a, uh, a non-single point of failure <laughs> architecture, we can probably eliminate console from our, our stack. Mm -hmm. um, what was the single point of failure that you mentioned? Um, so right, right now, the single point of failure is the swarm manager. So if the swarm manager dies, um, then the whole system stops working. Mm -hmm. So we're using console to basically elect um, a new swarm manager to expose the different swarm managers that are running. So if one dies, then we can, we can right. elect a, a different swarm manager. Got it. Thank you. Anybody else? Really? <laughs> So how do you handle isolation and security so that I'm running a tutorial about hacking and exploiting Docker, and then somebody else on your same swarm, it sounds like everyone's on the same swarm, how do you prevent people from, say, sabotaging someone's Python 101 workshop? Mm -hmm. Do you want to answer that, Brian? Or should I take it? Go ahead. Um, yeah, so security is, is one of the issues that we're working really hard to improve. Um, we're looking at set comp, so it allows you to spin up a container with like a more restricted environment than what is usually when you just run the docker run command. Um, we're also looking at SE Linux, which provides a more secure environment. Um, but that, that still is a pain point for us before we really open this up to kind of anyone to spin up. Right now we're doing this in a, in a fairly isolated manner with, with a customer or two, so we can kind of control the environment. But as we open this up to more people, we're gonna, we're gonna really be focusing on security and making sure that there's no malicious users that are logging in and exploiting the system. Are there any more questions? Going, going. 
gone. Okay, let's get another round of applause for Nathan Bryan, please. <laughs>